it says here, work, it says work willingly at whatever you do. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember 24 says, remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and the master you are serving is Christ. Amen. Let us pray, excellencies. Amen. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, mighty God, we come before the throne of grace, for we know in the throne of grace there is mercy. We thank you, Lord, for who you are in our lives. Mighty Father, we know without you we are nothing. We know, Jehovah, that you called us as your children, not because we did anything, but because of the love that you have for us. Lord, we thank you for the new day, for this is the day that you have made. We thank you that we are going to rejoice and be glad in this day. Mighty God, we thank you for this platform that we have availed to us to be equipped in all mountains of life. Mighty Father, we know that there are people who would love to be in such platforms, but they are not here. Here we are, we thank you. We don't take these moments or this platform, this platform for granted, mighty God. We thank you, Jehovah, for the leadership of GBR and GFFJ. Mighty God, as we are here this afternoon, we bring the program before the throne of grace. Mighty God, every activity that is going to be taken or undertaken, we say, Lord, take place, take your glory in it. We pray for the program director. Lord, we pray for the worship team. We pray for all speakers, mighty Father, men and women of God that you have equipped, that they should come this day to give us the information, Jehovah, the information that you'd like us to know. We thank you that this information that we are going to be equipped with we are not going to take it just as information, but we are going to be able to share it. We are not only going to be the hearers, but doers of the word. Mighty Father, for we know you want us to have this, this information in order to change our, 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 our communities. Lord, we thank you that Father God, that everybody that is going to listen to this that you have for us today is his life or her life is going to be changed. Lord, we thank you even for the technical team, mighty God, for having the opportunity or having the skill that has made us, Lord, in the comfort of our own homes, but we are able to communicate with each other. Lord, we thank you, Father, as we are here, mighty God, we bring all nations before you. We bring them before the throne of grace, mighty God, for we have been told about the Omnicron, mighty God. We know that your name is above this name. We know that when you intervene, mighty God, circumstances will change. Mudimuaka, we come before you and say, nobody is going to die. We declare life, life in abundance. Nobody is going to die, Lord. We are going to declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. For we know, Father, that we have brought these uh, uh, organizations to us so that we make a difference in the lives of people. Mighty God, we know that the glory belongs to you. We give it back to you in the mighty name of Jesus as we become amen. a true ambassadors in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. 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 Your Excellency, Madam Kagadi, thank you so much for your opening prayer. And thank you for reading Colossians 8.23. Work diligently. There are some Spanish versions that I love a lot because they use, uh, instead of the word that uh, uh, willingly or diligently, they use with excellence. And that is what God expects from us. Excellence as for him and not for human masters. Uh, we want you to know that uh, we usually have uh, 15 minutes to 30 minutes of uh, worship and praise. And uh, today we are experiencing technical difficulties. So we were not able to uh, play for you these 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, and since Madam Kagadi has also thanked our technical team, I, I want to really thank uh, Eliezer Gomat from Gabon and also Mr. Tabang uh, and Kosi because they made it possible to play at least two of the songs before we uh, started the meeting. So we are running late, about uh, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, but we will catch up. Uh, 
let me have uh, the, the program slide to let you know who will be speaking to us today. So may I ask Eliezer to display the main program slide with the pictures? Uh, as you can see, we have four international speakers. They are all law experts. So we will learn today about uh, what can be done when a person is dismissed at a workplace and it is done in an unfairly way. We have the honor of having an expert from the uh, Republic of South Africa. He's a CEO, Mr. Odirile. We have another expert from Lesotho, uh, advocate Redsepile. Uh, we have an expert from Kenya, uh, Maran Wangesi. And we also have an expert from Malawi, Mr. Mauya. I, I want you to I, uh, uh, pardon me, bear with me as a Hispanic. I am giving the, the best pronunciation to your names. So I hope you do not mind. Let me ask uh, Eliezer if it is possible to play the video of GBR or if we are not going to show the video. Eliezer, please. For those who are new, we usually play a video clip of about three minutes to let you know critical information at the Global Business Roundtable. So let's take a look at it. Global Business Roundtable has a God-given mission to focus on the holistic development of people in line with God's plan for His kingdom. The aim of the organization is to help members to grow spiritually, intellectually, to grow their networks and to participate in trade and investment opportunities, to also participate in mentorship and coaching programs and to expand their businesses. Our organization focuses on the holistic development of its members and invests its time and resources in developing people in key sectors, including the spiritual growth and development, which is critical to ensure and to foster strong moral values and, uh, and ethics, which we want to inculcate in all our leaders and standards so that we could contribute to the uh, production of a new breed of leaders that will shape and transform Africa and the rest of the globe. Since its launch in Johannesburg, South Africa in 2009, the Global Business Roundtable has impacted thousands of lives around the world. Ten years after its launch, this God-focused organization has a presence in more than 80 countries in the following regions. The Southern African Development Community, East Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, North Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, South America, and the Caribbean. GBR has strategic initiatives, programs, and platforms that facilitate growth and opportunities for its members. This is done through the global and local events such as World Congress, Prayer Camp, and the Thought Leader Summit, Women of Character Summit, Future Leader Summit, Trade and Investment Exhibitions, and GBR Sessions. These events create an environment for our members and partners to meet, interact, and create relationships that will develop their businesses and lives holistically. GBR also has a TV show called A New Thing, which seeks to educate, inform, challenge, empower, and inspire one to live their best lives in line with God's purpose by bringing in several experts from various fields and sectors together. The Global Business Roundtable believes that informed and engaged leaders can make a positive change in the world. The GBR Academy was established primarily to address leadership capacity within the Global Business Roundtable leadership structures. The GBR platform is an online system that exists to create opportunities for personal and professional development. It is poised to further facilitate trade and investment opportunities across nations and industries for big business. For more information on our organization, please visit www.globalbusinessroundtable.com or contact us on plus 2711-242-8000. Uh, thank you, Master Elias, for playing the video. 
to our audience and friends and colleagues tuning in uh, in South Africa and other parts of the world. As you watched in the video, the Global Business Roundtable is an international organization that empowers people. And by people, we are talking about individuals, about families, about communities, and also about businesses with one goal in mind, to advance the kingdom of God on earth. And uh, I happen to direct, as I said at the beginning, the Global Fund for Jesus. We have a similar uh, mandate and vision to advance the kingdom of God on earth too. But we do it uh, by doing what Jesus, what Jesus would be doing if he were physically present today on earth. So then these are two international organizations working to advance the kingdom of God. And I do want to say that uh, uh, the gospel uh, and praise uh, and worship song uh, that was played, and I hope that you heard it, Do It, Lord, by Benjamin Duve and uh, Jekalga Kart was beautiful because these two organizations want to advance the kingdom of God on earth. But the song, if, if you play, uh, paid attention, said, establish your kingdom in me. So that's the most important thing. We advance the kingdom of God on earth, but to do that, that kingdom has to be first established in our hearts. Let me ask then uh, Eliezer to uh, show you the slides of uh, our first speaker. Let me give you some of the highlights, but let me uh, advise each of our speakers, and we have four this afternoon, that you will have a, a total of 15, one five, 15 minutes to speak. Uh, I will turn off my camera. And when you see me back on your screen, that means that uh, you have spent 13 minutes. And we want to give you just two minutes more to wrap up. So please stick to the time. Uh, we hate to cut anyone, but we'll have to do so. So then please use uh, to the maximum the 15 minutes that you are allowed. Our first speaker comes from the Republic of South Africa. He's Mr. Odirile. He is a, a, a FinTech attorney, and uh, he's been working advising uh, with digital banking and corporate finance. He has extensive knowledge in uh, protection of personal information, POPI, as well as general data protection regulations. He's versed in contract law and reviews labor law management and negotiations. And he has also been advising on development of software uh, to build uh, bank grade software. He has extensive experience in litigation. So then he can really tell us what uh, a person who is dismissed unfairly can do. I'm going to leave with you, Mr. Odirile, uh, your 15 minutes start right now. Over to you, Mr. Uh, Odirile. Thank you, Program Director. Greetings to all excellencies. Receive my salutations in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I've just received word from Honorable Eliezer that they are not in possession of my slides. So I will try on my end to flight it. If you would just bear with me for a second while I I attempt to fly it. The um, slides. Can you can you see the slides? Kindly confirm uh, if you can see the slide. We we cannot see the slide. 
go to the green arrow that says share screen. Okay. Um, all right. In such in such event, then I suggest that. Okay. Let me let me re, let me read from the okay. slides while the technical team attempts to um, work things out. It appears I have gremlins here and yeah. Once again, uh, Mr. Ch um, touching mainly on the aspect of unfair dismissal with a specific focus on autonomy within the context of the Republic of South Africa. Principles that apply universally regardless of borders. It regards nine types of dismissals as automatically unfair when such a dismissal infringes upon education, <clears throat> i.e. when an employee is dismissed for attending workplace forums or when an employee participates in a protected strike. Employee refused to do work done by a worker who is engaged in a protected strike unless the work is necessary to avert danger to life, personal health, and safety. A refusal by an employee to accept demand in respect of a matter of mutual benefit between the employer and employee. This is usually in the case of wage negotiations at various bargaining councils. So an employer is not entitled to dismiss an employee for want of such employee refusal to accept the employer's bargain. That the employee took action or indicated to take action against the employer by way of one, exercising their, right, their rights conferred to them under the LRA, which is the Labor Relations Act, which is a primary legislation that regulates labor relations between employers and employees and has mostly codified the common law position regarding the same. Secondly, if such an employee participates in any other proceedings under the Act, or when an employee, is, for instance, is a female person and is dismissed for due to reasons of pregnancy. As we know in some sectors, they work um, abnormally long hours, so they don't necessarily take lightly to the female employees who are pregnant because that entails maternity leave and the like. And so it falls under a category of of dismissal that is automatically unfair in the face of it. Further categories of employee, be it directly or indirectly, indirectly on an arbitrary ground, including but not limited to employees, race, gender, ethnicity, social origin, color, sexual orientation, age, disability, religion, conscience, belief, political opinion, affiliation, culture, language, marital status, or family responsibility. Or a transfer or reason related to trans transfer contemplated in section 197 and 197 capital letter A. This section deals mostly with um, takeovers, measures, and acquisitions. 
usually the takeover company has its own employees and is less hesitant to retain more stuff than it has to because as a result of acquisitions and the like you have situations of redundancy and duplications of roles and the like so in certain instances and circumstances the lra extends protection and accord a cause rise to employees to have some of the employee benefits preserved including their contracts as well a dismissal is automatically unfair whereby an employee makes a protected disclosure based on the reasons or circumstances defined in the act that would be the protected disclosures act this one pertains to mainly whistleblowers if an employee by some other way or through their own senses come across information that pertains to um, a protected disclosure and such an employee discloses such information the employer cannot dismiss such employee and if he chooses to do so such a dismissal will be an automatically unfair disclosure unfair dismissal pardon me this is mainly done to protect public health or if information is of 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 public interest or pertains to personal safety health hazards or if an employee is aware of the contravention of any other crime that has been committed or lack of compliance by uh, the employer should anyone find themselves in an unfortunate position of being dismissed at their workplace based on the listed grounds above which has just touched on the remedy would be first to go to the ccma website to log on fill out the relevant forms which will refer the matter to con up con up basically is conciliation and arbitration whereby the commissioner encourages parties to first seek to resolve the matter between themselves and come to an amicable a resolution feeling which the matter is then referred to arbitration whereby the normal rules of evidence and a quasi judicial proceeding take place where evidence will be led and there will be cross examination of witnesses and submission of any other supporting document the ccma is an informal process that is designed to provide swift and comprehensive outcomes for both the employer and employee considering that in the world of commerce time is literally money and and if the shoe is on the side of the employee they would usually want the speedy resolve to the matter at hand because at the current moment in time they are unemployed so they would like to get a speedy resolution determination to their matter considering the other effects of unemployment which might be budgetary constraints the anxiety that comes with it and the like should the matter be referred to the ccma and be set down for hearing an employee can represent themselves at the hearing alternatively they can request for legal representation legal representation at the ccma 
By the way, CCMA stands for conciliation, Commission for Conciliation, Mediation, and Arbitration. Legal representation at the CCMA is not automatic. Uh, the counsel for the employers to make a representation for legal representation to be allowed. And one of the tests is comparative advantage and ability. More often than not in industrial relations, you may find any seasoned relations are not on equal footing. It's mostly horizontal. It's vertical, pardon me, not horizontal. You may find a seasoned employer well versed with the Labor Relations Act, whereas you have an employee who's relatively who in their age or exposure level of education. So as such, such an employee can request or require legal representation because they're not on equal foot vis-a-vis -vis comparative advantage. Automatic dismissal carries a maximum punishment of two years worth of the employee's salary should the commissioner find in favor of the employee. I thank you. That concludes my presentation, Mr. Chair. All right. All right. Thank you very much, uh, lawyer Odirile, for your presentation. Uh, Several key points that I noted that you mentioned are the following, that the principles of the Labor Relations Act are universal. So they should be followed in each of the countries. Two, you gave us examples of uh, reasons for dismissal, engaging in protective strikes, refusal to accept uh, employer's bargain, uh, pregnancy, race, gender, age, social status, beliefs, political affiliations, language. And also you mentioned that uh, these dismissals also happen when there are takeovers and mergers or acquisitions. There was a point that you made specifically for whistleblowers. And uh, whistleblowers, I come from Latin America and the Caribbean, remember, uh, whistleblowing in Latin America is something that is being encouraged, but it's dangerous to do because people are dismissed and it is very hard to win the cases. But you mentioned that here in South Africa, the employee has to file a complaint that goes to consideration and arbitration for an amicable resolution. And also you mentioned that uh, the employee can escalate so that then this goes to the commission for mediation and arbitration. Uh, and he can represent himself or get legal counsel. And uh, you also mentioned that uh, in many instances, uh, when the employee uh, is favored uh, or wins the case, he may be enjoying a benefit of up to two years of employee salary. Well, this is easily said than done. We will ask questions regarding the reality uh, when, when we go to our question and answer session. Let me, so thank you so much, Your Excellency Odirile, for uh, your advice and the summary that you presented. Let me ask now, Advocate Retsepile Gladwin, uh, to prepare, we will give the advocate 15 minutes to uh, advocate Rev Sepile has had extensive experience in high courts, in the Law Society of Lesotho, uh, in the electricity company as a legal officer, also in Lesotho, as a company secretary. And uh, he schooling in law 
His degrees come from several universities, University of uh, Cape Town, National University of Lesotho, uh, the University of Namibia, and also from the University of South Africa, UNISA. And uh, he has been exposed to a variety of uh, specialties and disciplines, including uh, corporate governance, litigation, labor court and labor appeals court. So we will ask Advocate Recepile to take over now and give us your 15-minute presentation. Over to you, Advocate. Thank you very much, Program Director. Are you able to hear me loud and clear? Very loud and clear. Good. I'm ready and fired up to make a presentation on this very interesting topic and fair dismissal at the workplace, the remedies thereof. I'll start briefly by bringing to your attention the legal framework in Lesotho pertaining to, to the labor law. Why do we have the labor law in place? We have labor law in order to achieve fairness and equity. Equity is all about the balancing power between the employer and the employee. Fairness is to see to it that everything that is done at the workplace is done in a manner that is fair to both parties, being employee and the employer. There is a rationale again for the labor law because when the parties adhere to good practice pertaining to labor law, we at the end of the day, we are able to achieve industrial peace and harmony. The labor, the law, the main law in Lesotho that governs labor relations is the labor code, the labor code order number 24 of 1992. This law, is based on ILO conventions and recommendations. That's the reason why when you look at section four thereof and C of the code, it will tell you that no provision of the code or the rules and regulations there and shall be interpreted or applied in such a way as to derogate from the provisions of an international labor convention, which has entered into force for the kingdom of Lesotho. This is now important point that I would like to underscore. In case of ambiguity, provisions of the code and of any rules and regulations made thereunder shall be interpreted in such a way as more closely conforms with the provisions of the conventions adopted by the Conference of international labor organizations and of recommendations adopted by the conference of the international labor organization we have a case here that is look a, a, a local classicus as far as this point that i've made is concerned is that one of alice versus national university of lesotho our act did not make provision for, for employees with family responsibilities. This lady had uh, her child sick, and then she had to see to it that um, she provides her with, uh, provides him with comfort during that period. When she reported back to work, her employer dismissed her, indicating that um, she was absent without leave. And the matter was contested before the court, and then the court invoked the provisions of ILO conventions and recommendations and said, no, there was nothing amiss about that arrangement. Indeed, the law provides for employees with family responsibilities. Let's move on. Dismissals at the workplace. For a dismissal to be fair, it must be both substantively and procedurally fair. When we say the, the, the dismissal is substantively fair, 
there must be a reason that is valid and fair for the employer to dismiss. That's when we talk of the issue pertaining to substantive fairness. When we talk of the procedural fairness, we talk of the procedure that must be followed before dismissing the employee. This talks to the principles of natural justice. For instance, the law of natural justice provides the Audi Alta Rampatem rule, meaning that you should hear the other side, provides that before you dismiss an employee, you must give him or her a hearing. Before you conduct a disciplinary hearing, you must give him an opportunity to respond to the charges that will have laid against him. And you must inform the, the, the consent employee that he can invite the witness, the witnesses to testify on his or her behalf. And in addition, he can actually get one of the employees to be his representative in the in the in the in the hearing. So let's bear in mind this fact because this is very important. Then we'll go to the remedies in light of this position that I've, I have highlighted to the effect that a dismissal must be both procedurally and, um, and substantively fair. We move on. May you move to the next slide, please? Reasons for dismissal. An employee can be dismissed for, 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 for any of the following reasons. Misconduct, unbecoming behavior at the workplace, incapacity, meaning work poor performance. As far as this one is concerned, we should, draw, we should bear in mind that the issue of incapacity is twofold. One aspect of incapacity relates to incompetence or incompatibility of an employee. Another relates to poor health or inability to carry out the employer's work on the basis of illness or, or, or any kind of um, hindrances that um, the employee may have. Another one relates to operational requirements. When we talk of operational requirements, we talk of instances where the job description or introduction of a technology or new technology has made it impossible for an employee to render services the way he used to do in the past. May we move to the next slide, please. The standard of proof in labor disputes is on the balance of uh, probabilities. Where an employee alleges an unfair dismissal, the onus is on the employer to prove on a balance of probabilities that the dismissal was fair. There are procedures that should be followed for each type of dismissal. For misconduct, that issue pertaining to un unbecoming behavior at the workplace, you must follow a disciplinary procedure. For incapacity, you must follow a procedure relating to counseling. If the employee is incompetent, you don't just dismiss him or her. You mentor him, you introduce him to training to upgrade his skill set so that he or she can render services in a manner that um, it was intended to be to be carried out. Operational requirement, retrenchment procedure must be followed. In this instance, we talk of the fact that there should be consultation before there is retrenchment of for consent employees. Remedies for unfair dismissal. Now we have come to the gist of what today's topic is all about. The remedies for unfair dismissal in our context, the Lesotho's context, is provided for under Section 73 of the Labor Code Order 
1992. For, for, for a dismissal that is substantively unfair, the primary remedy is reinstatement. Reinstatement or, um, is provided for under section 73, subsection one, which provides that if the labor court holds the dismissal to be unfair, it shall, if the employee so wishes, order reinstatement of the employee in his or her job without loss of remuneration, seniority, or other entitlement or benefits which the employee would have received had there been no dismissal. The court shall not make an order if it considers reinstatement of the employee to be impracticable in light of the circumstances. This is very important. The court here is called upon to make well-informed decisions as to whether it is feasible under the prevailing circumstances for the employee to be reinstated. Another one is that of compensation. This one is provided for under section 73, subsection two, which provides that if the court decides that it is impracticable in light of the circumstances of the employer to reinstate the employee in employment, or of the employee does not wish reinstatement, the court shall fix an amount of compensation to be awarded to the employee in lieu of reinstatement. The amount of compensation awarded by the labor court shall be such amount as the court considers just, let's underscore the words, just and equitable in all circumstances of the case. In assessing the amount of compensation to be paid, account shall also be taken of whether there had been any breach of contract by either party and whether the employee has failed to take such steps as may, reasonable, may be reasonable to mitigate his or her laws. The fact that the court can order, can, can provide a remedy of compensation. It is not a carte blanche on the part of the court to order any amount that it deems fit. He should take into account issues, he should consider just an, equi an equity. There should be justice in awarding compensation in a manner that we can say justice and equity has been observed. And in addition, the employee is called upon to remedy his laws. In our context, you'll find that the, the, the decision maker can order uh, compensation for any period that he or she deems fit. But in South African context, you'll find that for, 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 for a dismissal that is um, unfair, you can provide a compensation of 12 months. But for that which is automatically unfair, you can actually um, uh, uh, order a, re, uh, not reinstatement, a compensation. You can um, um, order that a compensation of 24 months be paid to the consent employee. Factors relevant in the determination of quantum of compensation are the following. The actual loss likely to be suffered by employee as a result of the unfair dismissal. The age of the employee. The prospects of the employee finding other employment. The circumstances of the dismissal. Mitigation of loss. I've already talked about this. This means that there should be attempts on the part of the employee to find alternative employment. You cannot sit at home and, and just expect that uh, the court will give you the compensation for, the, that for, for the rest of the period that you have not been waiting. Instances where compensation may be ordered in state of reinstatement or reemployment, where the employee does not wish to be reinstated. This is the instance where the employees say, no, I've had enough. I, I, even if 
I know you have ordered that I should be reinstated, but I no longer want to work there. Where the circumstances around this missile are such that a con continued employment relation relationship will be intolerable. Where it is not reasonably impracticable for practicable for the employer to reinstate or reemploy the employee, or where the dismissal is only procedurally fair. You Another one, minutes. which you is the one last minute more. Yes, which is the last one is the one of reemployment. This is a process of contracting whereby the employer and the employee enter into a fresh contract of employee. When the parties enter into reemployment, they may or may not be new terms and conditions of such new contract of employment. Reemployment, this is very important, does not necessarily result from dismissal of the employee. It, it, it can be done even when the employee is still employed. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes my presentation, and I thank you for having awarded me this opportunity to make this um, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, on the contrary, thank you. Thank you so much, Advocate Red Sepile. Uh, you complemented very well uh, the presentation of the first speaker, Your Excellency. You spoke to us about three critical areas. The first one, the achievement of fairness and equity. The achievement right. of fairness and equity for both parties, as well as the achievement of industrial peace and harmony as critical for success uh, in businesses. Two, you gave us three key reasons. Uh, for dismissals, misconduct, incapacity, poor work performance, and operational requirements. And it is interesting that, that you tied all of these to actions that the employer has to conduct so that then it, it can be fair and valid. So then you spoke about disciplinary procedures, about counseling procedures, and also about retrench, retrenchment procedures. And then third, you spoke to us about the remedies and then uh, you commented briefly on reinstatement, compensation that may be normally 12 months, but it could go up to 24, and reemployment. So thank you so much for this summary that you gave us. Uh, I want to bring the next speaker. And just let me say the following, my dear friends and colleagues all over the world where you are tuning this international session, we are speaking about unfair dismissals. Uh, uh, but listen, the other side of the coin is, what if you have to fire and terminate someone because of misconduct, incapacity, poor work performance and operational requirements? Uh, it sounds easier than, than, than how it is done. I can give you my experience working for Los Angeles County where we had all of the information uh, all of the disciplinary procedures and counseling procedures and the retrenchment, and still we couldn't dismiss people because they belong to unions, labor unions that protected poor performers. Uh, I remember that I was about 10, 10 years working for Los Angeles County. And in those 10 years, in my last year, uh, I did 52, the same number of uh, weeks, uh, you know, a year has 52 weeks. I remember that in my last year as director of public health in Los Angeles County, I did 52 personal actions, but I couldn't fire the people. I was able in 10 years only to fire two. And believe me, uh, I could have dismissed over a hundred. So then uh, it is easier said than done, even when you have good documentation. Okay, let's go to the next speaker. Uh, we have a lady we will hear now from uh, the insights of Madam Wangesi and Gumi. She's from Kenya. Uh, she's a born again Christian. Uh, she's married and she has three children. Uh, she holds uh, law degrees from Mo University. And also she's been admitted to the role of advocates in, since 2006. And uh, she has ample experience in labor issues, judiciary, and also she's currently the principal magistrate 
at the Chicago Law Courts. So please, uh, Madam uh, Excellency uh, Wangesi Ngubi, please benefit from uh, benefit uh, the audience and us from your 15 minutes uh, presentation. Thank you, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Greetings from Kenya. I take this opportunity to appreciate the opportunity to present uh, my presentation on the unfair dismissal at the workplace. It may sound as a repetition as most of what I'm going to present has already been presented by uh, the earlier presenters. I note that uh, most of our laws, as one of the presenters uh, put it, most of the matters relating employment are universal. I'll go ahead to the pre presentation where I'm going to introduce the laws governing employment in Kenya. The first law is the constitution, which is supreme. Article 24 of our constitution 2010 uh, provides for equality and freedom from discrimination. Uh, it also section 41 uh, talks about the labor relations that is a right to fair practices, uh, which entails fair remuneration, reasonable work conditions, right to join and participate in activities of a labor of a trade union, and also the right to go on strike. The principal uh, act or law governing uh, employment in Kenya is the Employment Act. And this is the one that provides for the minimum terms and conditions of employment relationships between employees and employers, the benefits, duties, and obligations of the employers and the employees. We also have the Labor, Reaction, uh, Labor Relations Act. The Labor Relations Act is the act that uh, um, uh, provides a legal guidance to the establishment of trade unions. We have the Occupational Safety and Health Act, which is the legal framework uh, that uh, provides for the employers to maintain a healthy working environment for the employers, the Work Injury Benefits Act. This is the law pertaining to compensation of employees who are injured at their workplaces. The Labor Institution Act provides for the labor institutions such as the National Labor Board. And also Kenya is a member of the ILO and has ratified and signed most of the international conventions and treaties. To the definitions, I'll not dwell much on it. Employment, I know we all know what employment is, dismissal and the unfair dismissal. Uh, when it comes to termination, I find that it is twofold. It can be initiated by either party. It can be voluntary or involuntary, and there is need for notice to be issued by the party that is terminating uh, the employment. Yes. Um, when it comes to notice, often it's named uh, based on the contract, the contract of employment, often we'll talk about the notice, the period of the notice. And if it is not uh, stipulated in the contract, mainly in Kenya, it's based on the duration for the payment of the wages and salaries. Say if one is paid a monthly salary, you're expected to give a notice of one month, two weeks, then two weeks uh, notice. If it is a casual employment where one is paid on a daily basis, there will be no need for a notice. The notice given uh, particularly to an employee must be understood and in the event that the employee does not understand the content uh, or what is written in the notice, he should be uh, explained to in a language that he understands. If no notice is given upon termination, a payment should be given in lieu of the notice. But notices need not be given in some instances. And these are the maybe the grounds that one could uh, 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 say are the grounds for termination in Kenya which are absenteeism, if a person absentees or an employee absentees himself from work without permission, he can be terminated without a notice. Issues of intoxication that causes the employee not to perform in his respective duties. If one neglects to perform a duty that is supposed to perform, 
or he uses abusive language or behavior to the employer or employees, making the work environment not conducive. The failure to obey a lawful command can also uh, constitute a dismissal. Uh, there is the lawful arrest in Kenya if you're arrested and not released within a duration of 14 days, either by way of bond, bail, or an acquittal or a discharge. Uh, this can be a ground for dismissal. And if you're suspected of a criminal offense to the person or the employer, uh, a person of the employer or his property, that could, too could be a ground for dismissal without notice. Uh, as my brother earlier had said from Lesotho, uh, the reasons for the procedure of termination has to be fair and lawful. An employee has a right to challenge the dismissal. Now, in Kenya, both the reason and the procedure is quite important when it comes to a determination on whether the termination was lawful or not lawful. Uh, one of the ways that uh, termination is, uh, uh, an employment is terminated is through redundancy. I chose to talk uh, briefly about redundancy because uh, this is an area that most people have suffered in the last two years, mainly uh, during the COVID era. And this is a mode of termination that is initiated by an employer. It is the loss of employment, occupation, job, or career by involuntary means through no fault of an employee, where the services of an employee are superfluous and the practice is commonly known as the abolition of office, job, or occupation and loss of employment. I'm of the view my brother from Lesotho has also covered this. Uh, he termed it as retrenchment. Uh, when this uh, redundancy is being done, number one, uh, redundancy is declared to an office, not to an individual. There should be issuance of notices to the employee. If the employee is not a member of the trade union, the notice should be served upon himself. If he's a member of the trade union, at the trade union in which he's a member should be served with the notice and also the labor office in all instances, whether he's a member or not a member of a trade union should be served with the notice. Uh, the notice should include the reasons, the reasons for the uh, declaration of redundancy, as well as the extent of the intended redundancy. The notice given should not be less than a month to the intended date of termination. If the notice is safe for 15 days, then it will be declared uh, Ill illegal. It has to be not less than uh, a month, 30 days. Consideration of factors such as seniority in time and skill, ability and reliability of the employee have to be considered. It has also been said, the employee should not be disadvantaged by his being a member of an or a non-member of a trade union. When it comes to uh, the terminal benefits that they're entitled to, he should benefit from the better option. That is, if there is a collective agreement or there is no collective agreement, he should not be disadvantaged. There should also be payment of leave days uh, where leave is due and the payment of not less than one month's notice or wages in lieu of the notice. The payment of severance pay ought to be paid also which should not be less than 15 days for each completed year worked. However, if there is a term on the, in the in their, uh, contract, the better of the two is what should be taken. The employer should, employee should not be disadvantaged at any time. Uh, just a repetition of what has been said before, the consultations have to be mandatory, they have to be participatory and informative and real and meaningful and not just a charade. Consultations are meant to allow the employer and the employee discuss and negotiate on a way out of the intended redundancy or the best way of implementing it. If it is unavoidable, taking measures to ensure as little hardship as possible is caused to the effect affected employees. A redundancy or restructuring or reorganization commenced with the sole purpose of laying off specific employees is a sham and is not justifiable. That is why I said that the redundancy should be 
uh, the, it's an office that is rendered redundant, redundancy, not an employee. If it was aimed or targeted at a certain employee or a group thereof, then it shall be declared a term and it shall be illegal. When one is declared redundant, this is more of a repetition, is entitled to encashment of leave days not taken, one month pay in lieu of notice, the severance pay uh, as calculated, 15 days for each completed year of service, and also the certificate of service as per section 51 of the Employment Act. Uh, this is a mandatory uh, provision and if one fails, an employer fails to give a certificate of service, he can be charged in a court and a fine, given a fine of not more than 100,000 Kenya shillings. Where the employment contract or a CBA provides for better terms on termination, the same ought to apply. Recourse on unfair termination, again, it has been said, the burden of proof, which is on a balance of probability also in Kenya, is on the uh, employer. And what he needs to prove is that the termination is valid, there is a fair reason for the termination and the fair procedure was adhered to. So it's all about uh, the reason and the procedure. If one is right and the other is wrong, it will be deemed to be an unfair termination. An employee in continuous employment of 13 months has a right to complain of unfair termination to the labor officer within three months from the date of termination of the court, termination, termination or to the court. Uh, again, uh, unlike in South Africa, it is not mandatory for the parties to present themselves to uh, the conciliation process. It's provided for in the act, but an employee may opt to either present self to the a labor office for conciliation or go directly to the court. The court that handles employment matters in Kenya is the Employment and Labor Relations Court, which is a court of equal status with the High Court, but also the Magistrates Court do handle employment matters where the gross salary is not more than 80,000 Kenya shillings. If the gross salary is more than 80,000, then the party has to go to the Employment and Labor Relations Court. Uh, when the court is determining whether termination was fair, they have to consider the procedure adopted. It has been said before, uh, the communication of the decision was proper and uh, the handling of the appeals was also proper. Uh, the, the court will also consider the conduct, conduct and capability of the employee to the date of termination the compliance with statute and procedural requirements, previous practice of dealing with the circumstances leading to the termination and the existence of warning letters. Often uh, uh, <clears throat> a, a party or an employer wants to terminate a person, they should not use a unique standard. They should use the practice that has earlier been used. If they uh, set other standards other than what has been previously used for the similar circumstances, it will be deemed to be a uh, discrimination and that will result to being an unfair termination. If a, if a termination is found to be unfair or unjustified, an employee is entitled to the remedies in section 49 of the Employment Act which remedies again are like those in Lesotho, where the employer fails or is underbound to fulfill the requirements established under section 49, a claim of unfair termination can be brought before the Employment and Labor Relations Court. I had said that before. So the remedies for unfair termination, there's the wages or rather my brother called it compensation, which is the wages payable had the employee been given the period of notice the proportion of wage due to the uh, period of time the employee has worked and any loss consequent arising from the date of dismissal and the date of expiry of the period of the notice. And uh, there's the equivalent of a number of months wages or salary not exceeding 12 months. In uh, South Africa, we were told it's 24 months. In Lesotho, they do not give a duration but in Kenya, it's not exceeding 12 months. You can only be compensated for a duration or a salary equivalent to 12 months uh, gross salary. 
The other remedy is reinstatement, which has been explained well, I need not uh, repeat, and also the re-engagement, which he called, I believe, um, uh, he called it re-employment or something. We call it in Kenya, re-engagement. Uh, before I conclude, I need to say that uh, often when I served as a, uh, a deputy registrar at our employment court in Nairobi, and one thing I noted is that uh, many people will find as though the termination or end of the employment is the end of the world. It may just be a blessing in this case. We should not cling to the issue of employment. We can look for other opportunities and the termination may just be a blessing in this case. Thank you so much for the opportunity. May God bless you. Uh, Your Excellency, Madam. Wangesi and Gumi from Kenya, thank you so much. Uh, it is usually said that the, the law of learning is repetition. So thank you, thank you to you as well as the previous speakers for repeating the concepts regarding key issues, critical issues regarding unfair dismissals. And uh, let me just uh, mention a couple of things that were different from your presentation. Uh, you emphasized on the timing of the notices. Uh, and you mentioned <clears throat> that uh, if, if I'm an employer doesn't follow the 30 day rule, then, then, then payment in lieu of the notice has to be made. Two, you, you spoke to us about remedies. Uh, I, this remedy that we have just mentioned, one month's pay instead of 30 day notice, but also you, you brought to the table the cash payment of any leave days that the employee may be uh, may, may have in the books. And also you mentioned a, a payment of 15 days uh, for each completed year worth, uh, but not exceeding 12 months. And also you again emphasize that the burden of proof, the burden of proof is on the employer. And something that I just learned uh, from you, uh, Your Excellency, is that in, in terms of redundancy, uh, the redundancy case has to be made on the office, on the department, on the program, the unit, not individually. So that's something that I didn't know because I, I have seen uh, redundancy dismissals, but targeted to individuals. But you clearly stated that these laws are universal and they should be applicable to the office and not a person. So thank you so much uh, for your teachings. Let me move now to our last speaker. Our last speaker is coming from Malawi. Uh, Mr. Mauya M. Suku, uh, he is a partner at Banda and Banda and Company, a law firm uh, based in Malawi. Uh, he has been an associate lecturer in labor law uh, at the University of Malawi. And his experience is ample as a legal advisor to a number of trade unions and national organizations. And he is an author of uh, uh, numerous uh, papers and articles on, on, on labor and employment law. So your 15 minutes uh, begins right now, Mr. Mauya, we turn this over to you. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, when you come at the very end, you find yourself, or oh, whatever you should have said has already been said. <laughs> and that's the situation I'm in. Uh, the, the, the last two speakers, a colleague from, uh, from Lesotho and, uh, and Kenya, they have basically <laughs> said everything that I should have, I should have said. Uh, I, I did not have an organized presentation, but maybe just a few uh, discussion, discussion points, which I'd emailed. I don't know if, if uh, they're able to be displayed. Uh, if not, then I think I could just uh, do a discussion just as my, uh, my colleague who did, I mean, at the, at the very beginning from South Africa. Now, in Malawi, uh, there are a number of pieces of legislation which actually govern the employment, employment law and labor law. 
uh, to agree with the uh, presenters that have presented before, uh, in most countries we would find that uh, substantive law in this area is basically the same. And the main reason really is that uh, most countries, all they have done is to rework on IRO conventions. So most often IRO conventions provide uh, universal guidelines as far as employment, employment and labor law are concerned. And most countries basically they'll just domesticate that and maybe make some few changes there to suit their uh, individual, individual interests, for example. But uh, substantially, most, most of the stuff will be, will be the same. And that's exactly what I've noticed here uh, with a uh, special discussion from uh, Lesotho and, the, and, and, and Kenya. So you see that my presentation will be very quick because much of the stuff has already been done. Now, in, in terms of uh, material, a uh, piece of legislation, in my view, I think we have about five pieces of legislation that govern employment law, which is uh, Employment Act, uh, Labor Relations Act, uh, Occupational Safety, Health and Welfare Act, uh, Workers' Compensation Act, and recently we also passed uh, Pensions, Pensions Act. Not all of them may be relevant, uh, for purpose of our discussion, I think much, I mean, the most relevant pieces of legislation could be Employment Act and Labor Relations Act. Now, coming now to the main uh, area of discussion, uh, unfair dismissal. Now, in terms of elements of, of unfair dismissal, we may look at it, as far as my law is concerned, you may look at it from four angles. The first aspect is that uh, dismissal is unfair where it lacks a substantive uh, justice. And I think my colleague from uh, uh, Isoto and, and, and Kenya discussed that at length, basically where there's no valid reason. And then the second aspect is where there's, it lacks a procedural fairness. The employer may have a valid reason, but where it doesn't follow the procedure. Then the third angle, is where the dismissal falls below what has been referred to as the principle of uh, equity and justice. So the employer may have a valid reason, the employer may follow all the procedure, but the law requires that the employer must also demonstrate that uh, in the circumstances, he actually acted with justice and equity. So that is a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, then finally, uh, is the principle of constructive dismissal. So very quickly, I'll just look at each, uh, each, each, each of those four aspects as how it has applied. Now, uh, the first aspect, as I said, is where there's, a there's no valid reason. Now, if one looks at the law, the law actually highlights grounds which may justify uh, dismissal. And the grounds are most exactly the same as what the colleague from, uh, from Lesotho uh, highlighted. The key ones, for example, is where the, the employer is guilty of serious misconduct that would make a continuation of the employment relationship impossible, or where the employer, the employee is guilty of habitual and the substantial neglect of his duties, or where the employee lacks skills, which he, they prophesy. Because at the end of the day, if you are getting employed, uh, there's, a pre, there's a presumption that you, are, you, you can display certain skills. If it can be shown that you lack those skills which you presented to the employer to have, then the employer can dismiss you. The another ground would be willful disobedience of lawful orders. And then finally, where you, the employee is guilty of habitual absenteeism from work without valid reason. So these are clear stipulated grounds, but there is a general ground, which is now the general misconduct. As long as you're guilty of misconduct, which would make it impossible for the employer you know, to continue with employment relationship. But then there are some grounds which the law specifically says cannot suffice as valid reasons. And they are most, almost exactly the same as what uh, my colleague from, uh, from Lesotho, uh, I think, uh, explained. And these are things like uh, participation in uh, a lawful, lawful industry action, or issues of race, issues of color, issues of gender, issues of political opinion. So all those that my colleague listed 
our law also lists them as uh, no divided grounds uh, for dismissal. Now, as regards to the procedure, again, it's really a matter of what at common law has been referred to of rules of natural justice. Before an employee can be dismissed, he must be accorded a right to be heard. So the same principles that apply at common law, the employer must act impartially, the employer must, uh, I mean, the employee must be accorded the right to cross-examine uh, the employee, I mean, the, the witnesses, the accusers. Uh, I may share that actually at some point, actually, of course, I authored a paper to questioning the, uh, the, the viability of this, uh, the, 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 this position. Because uh, at the end of the day, uh, the employer is one who is a complainant, and he will also be accuser, sometimes also be a witness, and then the law requires, expects him to be impartial. How possible is that? I, an employee steals from me, then I'm the one to make a decision, I'll be a judge, then I'm the complainant as well. But anyway, that could be a discussion for some other time. But the law expects you to meet the, at the minimum rules of natural justice. The employee must be accorded right to be heard. Then uh, uh, another aspect, as we've said, is that uh, the law expects that the employer must act with justice and equity. You may have valid reasons. You may accord the employee the right to be heard, but you, it, it must be shown that you acted with justice and equity. So for example, an employee who has worked for you for the past 30 years without any record, and then maybe is guilty of maybe uh, failing to account for maybe for example, $2, I, mean, I would use dollars for better appreciation because if I do use, use my local currency, maybe my colleagues may not appreciate. And then he fails to account for $2 and has worked for you for 30 years with no bad record. Are you justified, just dismiss him just like that? Yes, what he has done is you have valid reasons to dismiss. You might have accorded them the right to be heard, but are you justified? Did you just act with justice and equity? So the law also expects you to act with just and equity in all these circumstances. Then another aspect, as I've said, is the use of consecutive dismissal. Consecutive dismissal in our case applies where the employer is guilty of misconduct, which would make an employee impossible to stay. You know, sometimes the employers may not expressly dismiss you, but they will treat you in such a way that you can't actually be expected to continue working for them. No, so you live on your own, but basically you have been pushed out. The law still considers that as, as, as dismissal in the, in the context of, I mean, constructive, constructive dismissal. Now, quickly, let's look at the enforcement mechanisms. Just as our colleagues in Kenya, uh, in, in Malawi as well, basically we've got two main enforcement mechanisms. The first one is administrative, through the Ministry of Labor. We have labor office in every, count, in every district. So, and again, to go there is not mandatory. And uh, the labor office does not have adjudicative powers. It's more of a I mean, conciliatory approach where you are trying to put the two parties together. But unfortunately, both does not have adjudicative powers. Most often employers don't take them seriously. Sometimes they not, they may not even attend. Even if you summon them, they will not even attend because all they can do is just try to bring the parties together. If you fail, if one party doesn't show up, all they can do is to refer the matter to the court. Now in Malawi, we have got a specialized court, which you call Industrial Relations Court, IRC. So the IRC is responsible basically for all, labor, for all labor matters. In our case, IRC is not at the same level with high court. It's a subordinate court. It's subordinate to the high court. So uh, an appeal lies from the IRC to the high court. Of course, in our case, also the high court has unlimited original jurisdiction. So you can actually take the labor cases, labor disputes direct to the high court. But the practice has developed that uh, most often the high court will refer you back to the IRC. The challenge we have though is that in terms of physical presence, IRC is only uh, is limited in terms of physical presence. It's not in many places. Actually, physically it's only available in, uh, in three cities of, of Malawi, Blanta, Adilong, and Mzuzu. So we don't have it in the uh, many areas. So that is the biggest challenge. And then previously also as well, our court, our IRC used to sit with the panelists who are not, were not necessarily employees of the, of the court. There are people in the industry that would come, they would come as assessors to assist the court. Now, the challenge that we have had is that uh, because they, were, they are part-timers, they have committed um, commitments elsewhere, we have had the problems in terms of their availability. Just recently, of course, about two, three months ago, our parliament changed the law. Now we have removed the panelists 
And for those of us that are advocates of labor rights, we are celebrating that because we think that may go a long way towards uh, uh, speeding up the adjudication of, uh, of labor of labor of labor disputes. But the biggest change remains that in terms of fiscal presence, it's not uh, physical physically present in most areas. And at the same time, the personnel, like for example, the whole country currently only have maybe I think about uh, five chairpersons. Uh, the people who sit at IRC now, in our case, uh, we call them chairpersons, are not judges or magistrates. So we only have five for the whole country. Uh, so that is, 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 is a big challenge on our on our part. But being a specialist court, at least has got its own uh, advantages as well. Now, going uh, tackling a bit on uh, just to connect with what my previous uh, colleagues have raised. Uh, in terms of again grounds for dismissal, we it may be on the grounds of capacity, which goes towards uh, one's ability to perform. It may go towards conduct, which is now your general conduct. It may, may, may not necessarily be directly in terms of your capacity, but maybe general conduct. So how do you rate with other? You may be the best performer, but how do you rate with with other employees? Then also the issues of uh, operational requirements. Operational requirements. Again, it can be a ground for dismissal, I mean, for termination, but in our case, not necessarily referred to as dismissal as such, uh, but it falls within the category of, uh, of, 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 of termination. Unfortunately, our law does not insist that in case of uh, uh, operational requirements, there should be strict procedure. That's the biggest challenge as far as our law is concerned. Now, going to the remedies, the available remedies are most exactly the same as uh, my colleague in Lesotho has presented. And again, as my colleague in, uh, at, in, in, in Kenya has presented. So we have uh, compensation, we have uh, uh, re-engagement, we have reinstatement. And the principles are exactly the same as presented by uh, my colleague from Lesotho and a colleague from Kenya. Except for one thing that I need to raise in terms of uh, the minimum compensation. I think there's been a reference to that uh, Kenya has talked of maximum, and I think South Africa as well. But in our case, there's no maximum. What the law provides for is the minimum. So, for example, the law requires, I mean, it states that uh, where a person has worked for, has worked for uh, uh, a year to five years, then is entitled to not less than uh, uh, one week pay for each year as a composition. If he has worked from uh, six years to 10 years, then he's entitled to not less than uh, two weeks pay for each year as a composition. Uh, where he has worked for uh, 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 10 years, up to 15 years, then is entitled to at least three weeks pay for each year of service. More than 15 years, uh, it's a one month, one month pay uh, for each year of service. That's the minimum compensation. In terms of maximum, the court has, uh, has uh, discretion. It can, uh, this guy could be the limit. But even with that, we, however, also have the guiding principles, which are the same as what my colleagues have said in terms of contribution. Uh, what did the, I mean, what was the employee's contribution? Did the employee demonstrate mitigation? You know, because there could be some cases where the employer divide the reason, but maybe just uh, missed on the procedure. You cannot compensate the same with as uh, somebody who has, I mean, where there was no reason at all. Then the issue of mitigation, which has already been uh, uh, dealt with. And then even where the employer had divide reason, you look at the extent of uh, uh, reason, you look at the, uh, the previous conduct of the of the employer, so all those are things that are taken are taken into consideration. So, Fifteen uh, minutes, Mr. Leto, your time is up. Please wrap up. Thank you so much, and that's where I close my presentation. Okay, good, excellent. Listen, thank you so much. Uh, although you started by mentioning that um, most of the speakers had already mentioned what you were going to talk about, I think that you managed, and we congratulate you to make your presentation somewhat uh, different also, okay? And we learned from you, Your Excellency Letton, four different perspectives and angles to discuss these missiles. 
from uh, a no valid reason to procedural fairness uh, where the employer doesn't follow the process uh, to situations in which the employer does not or cannot or fails to demonstrate equity and fairness. And also you spoke to us about a constructive dismissal. You were you managed to uh, differentiate uh, the Malawi law by explaining to us the the, the minimum payments uh, according to how many years people have worked from one to five years, five to 10, 10 to 15, 15 plus. And for each of them, there are incrementals of uh, weeks uh, of payment for, for each uh, service year. Uh, so we thank you. We thank all of the speakers. <clears throat> and then uh, we began late. So then we have, we do not have much time, but, but I, I would like to do something because I, I wanna ask a question. And if, if I may, I would like all of our speakers to turn on their, their videos, okay? Uh, I would like to see them as a panel. Uh, these are lawyers that are with us. And I would like to present to you a case, okay? And then uh, I would like to call upon any of you who may want to respond. But this is a, a quick response, a one minute. Listen, uh, I already mentioned to you, Los Angeles County, 10 years as a director of public health. The issue is not being able to dismiss anyone, okay? Even for poor performance or misconduct, okay? because the unions protect them. So then any thoughts uh, or any uh, experiences that you may have uh, that relate to this experience in Los Angeles County in California, United States, who would like to respond quickly? Yes, not Thank everyone you. at the same time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Um, I'm not so sure if I understand your question, clearly, but I I lost you, Mr. Od Odirile. But but the question I, is that that that, that, that the question is being being yeah. unable to dismiss, although you have grants to dismiss because the employee is protected for decades uh, by labor unions. So what are your suggestions or experiences? I must say it's a rather bizarre one because okay. if there are solid grounds upon which a person can be dismissed and that such a person cannot be dismissed owing to the interference of the unions, I would, I would, I must say it's a rather interesting one, and I would like to see the basis of such. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank of, you. Of dismissals of such employees. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Odirili. Uh, this, yeah. this happens. Let me, let me, let me tell you, dear audience. This happens in the United States. Labor unions protect. This is my experience. The poor performer, uh, and it's very difficult to fire fire people. Uh, let me ask another question. Let me tell you something about Latin America and Guatemala, and, and I want uh, any one of you to make a comment. In Guatemala, although we have very strong laws, they are only in writing, because the bottom line is that they are difficult to enforce, and then employers force employees who have been unfairly dismissed okay, to follow a legal suit but then the employee has to come up with the money to pay the legal counsel. And then the employers who have the money, they delay all of the cases for months or for years until the employee runs out of money. This is a practice that is happening very often. Does that take place in uh, your countries, in Malawi, in Lesotho, in South Africa, or in Kenya? Uh, in Malawi, for example, 
it's uh, we really have a problem with the delayed cases. Sorry, I can't turn on my video because that's uh, okay. That's okay. I've just noticed my battery is running low. <laughs> um, in Malawi, we really have serious problems as far as delays are concerned. All right, I, I'll, I'll give you my own practical example right now. There is a case which I am doing. We have just put an appeal from the industrial court to the high court, and the the case started in two thousand and seven. Uh, this is now this is now 20 it basically means 14 years the case has not yet been concluded and uh, and uh, we have so many of such of such cases uh, for us in our case really it may not necessarily be the fault of the employers but maybe taking advantage of the system the system is problematic as i said earlier on to say for example there was a time we used, used to sit with the panelists and the panelists were time part-time uh, members of the, of, the, of, of the panel, right? So they have commitments elsewhere they would only come to do when, they, when their convenience so allows. And then, in, as was said, for example, the Industrial Court only has five, if not six chairpersons, saving millions of people. So most often what will happen is the employers will just take advantage of the system, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, in terms of delay, in case I don't know in other in other jurisdictions, but in our case, I think it's, it's it has been really a worst worst nightmare that we've had as far as the enforcement of labor rights is concerned. Thank you. Okay. May I also may I also yes. um, add something? True, true. It is true that um, there are delays in completion of cases that are filed before the tribunals. But we should not lose sight of why we had specialized labor tribunals. The reason why we had specialized labor tribunals was to see to it that the disputes are exp expeditiously dealt with and less courtly and in a less adversarial, adversarial manner. If the employee can actually sustain litigation financially for elongated period of time, he, 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 he is likely to, 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 to develop a bad reputation. There's a lot at stake because a company should strive to be seen to be a decent corporate citizen. If you frustrate justice system, at the end of the day, you'll find that um, um you have a loss you you have a lot to lose because even the best employees who would like to work for you because you have gained that notoriety you'll find that you no longer attract the best brains to serve in your organization you should be somebody who is fair when when a misconduct has been committed you should allow a procedure and uh, the and uh, and the process to run its course. If the employee is found guilty, dismiss him. If the employee is not found guilty, just allow him to remain in his employment rather than uh, be seen to be employing delaying tactics, which are necessary. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Recepilia, thank you so much. Uh, I want. I want. Yes, uh, Madam. Yes, if I could comment for Kenya. Uh, yes. In Kenya, we have uh, strong trade unions, and at the same time, we have strong employment uh, employer federations. And also, uh, the employees are, uh, are at liberty to have an advocate represent them. For a long time, there was a lot of delay in the hearing of matters, mainly because we only had uh, six courts, employment and labor relations courts, with only 12 judges throughout the country. And hence, there was a lot of backlog. But uh, later on, the Chief Justice gazetted, uh, gazetted magistrates to handle employment matters, and now the matters are moving. The other thing that uh, is being done in Kenya, courts are being encouraged to use case management. Uh, case management has really tried, whereby upon pretrial, a matter has been certified ready for hearing, it will be very difficult to get an adjournment to delay the matters. So for the last two or three years, employment matters have really been moving. It's not business as usual where one would know that uh, once you file a matter, it would take six years, it would take five years. It's no longer the case in Kenya. 
Okay, mm. listen, thank you, thank you so much. Let, let me do the following. Uh, let me go through the uh, screens to see if we have a question from our audience. So if you have a question, quickly raise your hand. Uh, I do not see a, a Priscilla. Uh, do you have a question, Priscilla? Madam Priscilla? No. Ah, yes, Mar Madam Priscilla. A, a, Thank you. We are, uh, we're running very late, so then a very quick question, please. Okay, just a quick one. And the question is to all the panelists. Don't, don't you think, and this is my personal view, don't you think that uh, in most jurisdictions, the Employment Act is biased towards the employee as opposed to the employer? And I'm speaking that uh, in uh, alluding to the fact that Dr. Ricardo mentioned where you have an underperforming employee, but you cannot fire. And not necessarily because of the union, but the way the act in most jurisdictions, the way the act is uh, stated, it favors the employee as opposed to the employer. For example, if, if uh, I employ somebody today and I discover that maybe he or she and as oversold himself, it would be very difficult for me to fire that employee. On the other hand, when the employee discovers that maybe I'm not the right employer fit, they can easily resign even if it means resigning with a check without serving the notice. So my question is, don't you think that is unfair also on the side of the employer? Thank you. Let me, let me choose- I would like to one. get a first bite. Uh, yeah, no, no, I was going to give you the entire bite. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, okay. Th there's a school of thought to the effect that uh, labor legislation is um, geared or it is structured in, in such a manner that it gives or it provides too much protection to the employees. Yes, that's a perception, but I beg to differ because previously, the employees were not protected. For instance, in the past, you will find that as long as there is a reason for an employer to dismiss, he will dismiss forthwith. But uh, in this day and age, for an employer to dismiss, there must be a reason for him to dismiss and he should follow a fair procedure before a dismissal. So previously, the, the, the employees were not protected. Remember, we talked to the principle of, we talked about the principle of equity. Now there's equity. There is balancing of power that reposes on the on both the employees and the employers. So the, the, the scale, I think, is balanced. Yes, there might be that perception, but as far as I'm concerned, I think that the scale of justice is now is now balanced. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Let me turn this over to uh, Your Excellency and Yashi. Could you ask your question, please, uh, in less than a minute? And Yashi, your hand is up. Okay, thank you very much. I was actually unmuted. Uh, so my question goes to the third presenter. One of the reasons she mentioned uh, where an employee can be dismissed is there when the employee has been arrested for at least 14 days. Now my question is, um, of course, I'm not very familiar with these uh, legal procedures and all that, but in my understanding, it's possible for one to be arrested and then later to be cleared by the court. Do you think it's fair then to be dismissed on the basis of uh, being arrested and not waiting until maybe there's a conviction from the court. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe uh, that the issue here is when you do not communicate because as you have uh, properly put it, one is presumed innocent until proved guilty. But now there's the issue of uh, presence in court, in, in, at your workplace. You're supposed to be at your workplace. Now, who would be performing your duties for the duration of 14 days if you're not there? Would it be construed to be more of absenteeism because somebody has either way to perform your work? 
That is why I, uh, I, I believe uh, they put the duration of 14 days because in Kenya, all offenses are available. You can be subjected to bail or bond and still go back to your workplace. But if you're not able to go back to your workplace, it may be construed as uh, uh, absenteeism. Uh, thank you, Madam Ngumi. And uh, let me just take one more question. Uh, it's going to be a quick one. Uh, let me turn this over to His Excellency John Suira. Over to you, Your Excellency. Unmute yourself. Uh, yes. Unmute yourself. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for recognizing me. I'm so happy and honored to be part of this uh, brilliant discussion and uh, so fruitful and uh, indeed enlightening. I should take this opportunity to thank uh, the panelists who have done a brilliant job. I think we thank God for that. However, I wanted to do a bit of clarification, especially from the uh, previous uh, question, a uh, follow-up to the previous question which has just been asked. In the event that uh, one has been found that he has, been, he has committed a crime, which is legally supposed to be dismissed, does it require employers to go through the uh, due process like calling for the to be heard uh, using natural justice, they call natural justice whereby that they have to hear that person uh, before they take a decision. For instance, the person, the employee uh, was arrested that automatically means he has to be dismissed. Does the employer need to take uh, the due process like uh, hearing him uh, follow a principle of natural justice or else he is automatically dismissed or like that? And that's what I wanted to get clarification. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Your Excellency. Who wants to take this question? Who wants to have a bite or the entire bite? Well, I could comment on the same. Thank you very much. It is not automatic that the moment you're charged or uh, suspected of having committed an offense, you're automatically uh, dismissed. You're still entitled to the right to fair hearing, even in your workplace. Uh, the fact that, you know, the standard of proof when it comes to uh, criminal matters is beyond reasonable doubt. Whereas in civil matters, it's uh, to a balance of probability. So if there is a fair hearing and you're found not to have to be cul uh, culpable, you do not have really to be dismissed from, from your uh, employment. However, if you're convicted of the offense, upon now the hearing, you've been charged of a criminal offense, and you have been had, gone through the due process and are uh, jailed for more than, uh, is it that is, uh, three months, then you're automatically dismissed. But when it is suspicion, you can still go on with your work. It is not an automatic dismissal. I hope I've answered the question. Oh, I think you did. And I want to thank the panelists and I want to thank the audience for the questions. It's been very interesting. Uh, the dialogue that we have had, learning more about unfair um, dismissals and the remedies. Let me close uh, then the question and answer session. And we will move to the offering uh, uh, for this afternoon. And I will uh, call upon uh, an excellency from Senegal, uh, Madam Grace M. Beko, to lead us uh, in the offering. Over to you, Madam Grace. Greetings, Your Excellency. It's once again it's a privilege and a pleasure to be with you. I'm out in my car, so I hope the sound is going through clearly. Sound is good. So today I would like to invite us to worship our Lord through our giving. And the thought came from the book of Mark, 
chapter 14, verse 3 to 9, but because of time, we won't read it. But basically, it's the story of the alabaster box. And we all know that when Mary broke the box and anointed the Lord, people were appalled because they, 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 they even said that we could have sold the Nard for over 300 denarius. So Jesus replied that she did something good for him and that poor people will always be there for us to take care of them. And GFFJ is Jesus' hand today to help, to assist, and to do good in the name of the Lord. So as you give to GBR and GFFJ, the GFFJ is able to give hampers to, to promote and finance entrepreneurship, training, food security, and so much more. So do not hesitate to lend a giving hand by giving to the kingdom through the GFFJ. As you can see, the banking information are displayed on your screen. And I will just pray that the Lord will bless each and every one that will give. And as you may know, you are able to give in currencies, but you can also give in kind, buildings, land, whatever the Lord put on your heart to give, feel free to give it to the Global Fund for Jesus. Father, I want to praise you, I want to raise up your name. You are our banner, you are our shield, you're our protector. Everything we have, we have it because you allow us to have it. This is why we give part of it to you in order to further your kingdom, in order to further your plans, to work your will on this earth as if you were physically here with us. Father, remember all those that will give today and encourage those that might not understand how to give yet or that might not be convinced yet. Holy Spirit, you're the one that does the convincing. So please be at work in the midst of the members, but also anyone listening to this audio or viewing this video later on, on YouTube or Facebook, so that the mission will be accomplished and the work will, work, will go forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the offering. In the mighty uh, name of Jesus, we have prayed, and together we say amen. Amen. Thank you, Madam Grace, for the offering. Uh, let me just remind you that uh, the Global Business Roundtable is uh, a, a catalyst for the Global Fund for Jesus. And then these are GBR, international sessions, in which we are equipping uh, people and businesses, and we are learning at the same time. And then we take an offering, and this offering supports the programming of the Global Fund for Jesus. Just let me give you an example. Over the month of uh, November, we distributed uh, a total of 2,100, 2,100 food, uh, school, clothing, and uh, seed hampers to indigent uh, populations in four provinces in South Africa. We plan to do this in nine provinces next year. But the reality is that since we are opening offices uh, in many regions of the world, we envision that next year we will be delivering thousands of hampers around the world. And two, uh, also we had an NGO, non-governmental organization grant awards and uh, we gave 20 grants up to a hundred thousand run to organizations that we chose that uh, are working with integrity with accountability in poverty alleviation and improving the health of the people as well as their education and socioeconomic means uh, so this is where the money is spent thank you so much let me turn this over now to Mr. Taban and Kosi from the South Africa and ask him to do the announcements and the board of thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Program Director, Dr. Ricardo Calderon. And your excellencies, I greet you all in the wonderful name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to do the global announcements, but also the vote of thanks. 
I will not uh, read the announcements word for word as they are displayed on your screen. So the first announcement goes as such. <clears throat> Kindly note that the last GBR international session for this year will be next week, which is the 11th of December, 2021. We will be taking a break from hosting the international sessions, but we will resume again next year on the 8th of January, 2022. If you have missed the previous sessions and you would like to catch up on all the powerful sessions that we've had, you are encouraged to go visit our website, which is www.globalbusinessroundtable.com, or you can just go onto YouTube and search for GBR International or Global Business Roundtable. <clears throat> and on the behalf of the GBR Board of Directors and also the JFFJ Board of Trustees, we would like to extend our sincere gratitude to each and every one of you for having made the GBR Thanksgiving as well as the JFFJ NGO Grant Awards an astounding success. May the good Lord continue to bless you all abundantly. GBR is also proud to introduce its Mobi app, which is available for conferences, meetings, online sessions, registrations, and many other features as well. You are encouraged to download the app from the Apple store or also the Android store as well. Also, you are also encouraged to support the GBR worship team who have their music available on iTunes, YouTube, Amazon, and many other digital music stores together with CDs and DVDs. We are encouraged to support them as they give us beautiful worship before the session and also after the session as well. To be part of the network of the Global Business Roundtable, you're encouraged to visit our website, which is www globalbusinessroundtable.com. And then I'll skip the one on fasting because our fasting happens from January to November. And those are the global announcements for this week. We now move on to the vote of thanks, starting firstly with His Excellency Dr. Ricardo Calderon, who is our global executive for GFFJ. We'd like to extend our gratitude for having directed the program on the topic of unfair dismissal at a workplace and what are the remedies thereof. So thank you very much, Your Excellencies, for having run the program very well. We'd also like to thank our GBR worship team that continues to give us beautiful worship 30 minutes before the session and also after the session as well. Thank you very much, team. We'd also like to thank Her Excellency Ms. Khadi Liopeng from South Africa, who has done the opening prayer. We thank you, Your Excellency, for that. We'd also like to thank our main presenters and our main speakers, <clears throat> starting with His Excellency, Mr. Odi Rile, from South Africa, and uh, Advocate Ritsepile from the Kingdom of Lesotho, uh, Ms. Ngumi from uh, Kenya, and Mr. Msuku from Malawi. Would love to thank you very much, Your Excellencies, for having taken the time out to come and share the very powerful nuggets on the topic of unfair dismissal at a workplace. We thank you and we're grateful to you all. Would also like to thank Her Excellency Ms. Grace Mbeko from Senegal who did our offering. And in closing, we'd like to thank Her Excellency Ms. Winrose from Kenya who's gonna come and do the closing prayer. But also lastly, we'd like to thank the technical team which continues to organize and host these events every week. And also to yourselves, your excellencies for attending these powerful sessions to your benefit and the benefit of your family. 
We thank you uh, to you all and may God continue to bless you. Good day. Uh, Your Excellency, <clears throat> Mr. Taban, thank you so much for the announcements and vote of thanks. And then we are coming to the closure of our program. It's been really a pleasure. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, uh, I've been three weeks. It will be four weeks next uh, uh, Saturday when I go back to Guatemala. So the next time that I speak to you, I'll, I'll be speaking to you from the Americas. So it's been a pleasure, a privilege, and a blessing uh, to spend time in your beautiful country of uh, South Africa. Uh, listen, I think we all have learned. This is our online training. This is our online university. Uh, I, am, I am very appreciative of what we have learned. The topic, as we discussed, is not a cut and dry topic. Uh, we didn't exhaust, okay? Uh, the topic was unfair dismissals and remedies. But remember that we introduced two critical issues taking place uh, around the world. And that is employers taking advantage of employees and also employees taking advantage of employers so we hope we have another opportunity to talk about the critical issues of wrongful terminations in the future let me turn this over then to uh, madam windrose karovi from kenya and let me ask her to close our international session in prayer and after that we will have uh, praise and worship music for those who would like to stick around a, a bit more. It's been a pleasure being with you. Madame Winrose, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ricardo. I uh, will also want to thank the GBR leadership for this opportunity. My name, like you've heard, is Winrose Karoki from Kenya. I want to thank all the excellencies that have been able to speak to us today. Uh, I'm a victim of unfair dismissal and you can agree with me that most employees are not informed in this area. So we are happy to have such a session organized by our leaders to meet one of the object objectives, which is to enhance wholesome growth. So thank you. And in Kenya, we say Asante Sana. So let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we honor you today. Thank you for this opportunity to gain knowledge and wisdom through this, your servants that you brought our way, O oh God. You're the one who said in your word that my people perish because of lack of knowledge. Thank you because of shedding knowledge in this area, Almighty Father. We pray that even as we go through life, that we may not be subjected to unfair dismissal. And if we are, O oh Lord, we shall know how to react and we shall know how to approach best depending on the situation and how and what we've learned from this session. Thank you even as we depart. We pray that you will keep us safe until our next meeting. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Your Excellencies, goodbye until next Saturday. Goodbye.